Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Private Podcast, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek E. Silva. Today, we're speaking with Michael Castor. Michael is a human rights advocate and researcher. He's the co-founder of the human rights organization Safeguard Defenders and its China-based predecessor, the Chinese Urgent, Urgent Action Working Group. He's the editor of The People's Republic of the Disappeared, Stories from Inside China's System for Enforced Disappearances. Michael, thanks for taking the time to be here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's dive right in, and uh, I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit about Safeguard Defenders. Uh, sure. And I mean, just to add, actually, in the various hats that I wear, uh, I'm also the Asia Digital Program Manager with Article 19, which is a London-based yeah. international freedom of expression organization. Um, and uh, Safeguard Defenders, uh, founded in 2016, uh, coming after, as you mentioned, the uh, crackdown, really the, the crushing of a, of a former organization called the Chinese Urgent Action Working Group that itself had been in operation since around 2008, 2009. Um, we had been operating as an underground organization in China up until that point, but unfortunately, uh, despite a pretty uh, robust series of security protocols, uh, there was really just no uh, resisting the crackdown on civil society that had started really in 2015. So myself and colleagues were forced to regroup and, and reform Safeguard Defenders. Um, and since its founding, it's really grown, I think, into being a really leader in pursuing a number of advocacy, research, uh, campaigning activities on arbitrary detention and forced disappearances, torture, uh, forced confessions in China. Um, as well as recently working uh, to expose a lot of the weaponization, so to speak, of how China has pursued various bilateral uh, legal uh, or law enforcement uh, agreements and extradition agreements in pursuing Chinese regime opponents around the world. So um, obviously there's, there's you know, a lot of different angles that you could come at this from, but what inspired you to, to found safeguard defenders and and get involved with the uh, China Urgent Action Working Group before that? I, I mean, I had first gone to China in, in 2008 to be a fellow with another human rights group that uh, when I arrived, I found out really didn't exist anymore. The, the woman who had founded that organization, uh, Maggie Ho Wen Zhou, uh, she had been kidnapped and tortured by the police and uh, when I arrived, really, it was a, a baptism by fire, so to speak, of, of helping her uh, to secure some identification that had been taken by the police and eventually to have, uh, you know, secure relocation in another country. Um, and what started, I think, as just a plan to be a short-lived period of time in, in China uh, turned into really the, the arc of my, my career, in a sense, I think. And I uh, stayed for a number of years after that. Um, first with uh, a number of Chinese human rights defenders, incredibly courageous lawyers and journalists working at the Chinese Urgent Action Working Group. And then really in, in response to the, the horrible ab abuses that I saw happening to colleagues, people that were um, you know, devoting their lives to protecting the rights of normal everyday Chinese citizens who were victims of enforced disappearance, uh, um, evictions, uh, torture, uh, you know, any number of, of really serious rights abuses, um, then becoming themselves victims of rights abuses, the lawyers and the journalists. Um, and it, it really just became, uh, I think, too much to, you know, to stand idly by and, and watch happening. And we knew, even though one organization had been uh, crushed and kicked out of the country, that there was so much work to be done. Um, in support of and solidarity of many colleagues, um, courageous individuals. Uh, so we refounded uh, Safeguard Defenders uh, to carry on a lot of the really needed work uh, in defending, promoting, protecting human rights in China. Fair enough. I think that's uh, obviously a worthy goal. What are some of the most critical challenges to human rights that Safeguard Defenders is facing um, and adv advocating for right now? I think that what we're seeing is the really very sophisticated uh, expansion of China's 
influence and China's control in the world. Um, there are shockingly still world governments, um, companies, individuals, public intellectuals that are apologists for the human rights abuses from the everyday to the crimes against humanity in, in Xinjiang. Um, but by and large, I think we are seeing more and more people finally coming around to accepting the degree of uh, abuse, daily abuse, everyday violence, the, the human rights abuses that exist that are rife in China. But what we're unfortunately still a long way from accepting is how China has continued to extend its influence, its uh, disdain for the rule of law internationally. And we see this with how China has hijacked a number of international multilateral institutions, uh, the way that it has attempted to manipulate the red notice system at Interpol to pursue political opponents. And not to say China is the only country that abuses Interpol, Russia, Iran, others, Saudi Arabia certainly also do. Um, but we have seen a really sophisticated effort from China to position Chinese party uh, officials at high level positions at UN agencies. Um, and in particular, we have seen how through financial incentives, through uh, so-called direct exchanges, China has pushed a particular uh, state media narrative, a particular state media approach to journalism through uh, funding content at small publications around the world that will fill the, the pages of small uh, local uh, news media with CCTV or Xinhua or, or Chinese state media generated content, all the way up to uh, broadcasting through China Global Television Network in parts of Europe. Um, one of the things that Chinese state media is known for broadcasting is forced confessions. And I've had colleagues and close friends who have been um, through periods of prolonged uh, incommunicado detention forced into delivering forced confessions. It's very unsettling to see a friend or someone you know delivering a forced confession, a confession you know has been extracted through uh, coercion. And for years even, uh, China Global Television Network, CGTN, was allowed to broadcast in the United Kingdom, was allowed to broadcast in other parts of Europe. Um, one of the great uh, successes, I think, of Safeguard Defenders advocacy is through a series of complaints with the British Office of Communications uh, and uh, in support of a number of victims of forced confessions, Angela Guay, the daughter of Guay Minhai, who's a Swedish citizen, uh, born in China, but naturalized Swedish citizen who was forced to deliver three forced confessions. Peter Humphrey, a British citizen, also forced to deliver forced confessions. Um, working with them, uh, safeguard defenders managed uh, through the complaints process with the British Office of Communications to revoke CGTN's broadcast license in the UK and is in the process of doing that elsewhere. Um, I mean, this is one example of the various ways that China has really been pushing a particular narrative misinformation, disinformation, information operations around the world, um, which I think is really very concerning and, and one area where Safeguard Defenders has worked uh, not only closely, but with, I think, quite a bit of uh, success. Yeah, and I guess uh, I imagine this for them, at least, this is probably a natural extension of uh, uh, economic initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative, right, where they have highways and ports and all that that they're funding um and i know at least there have been a few instances where the terms for repayment uh especially on a poor african country's government are so um so harsh that it, it feels like they're actually trying to force the government into not being able to pay the loan back and then of course they get control of the port uh, you know, put a, a state-owned company in charge, and now all of a sudden they have control of this incredibly vital asset, um, you know, somewhere in the world that um, otherwise they wouldn't, they obviously wouldn't own. Um, and and I think many people know that they've been acquiring ports all over the place, like, you know, through fun, normal financial means as well. Um, at least to me, this, this all seems to go really well together where they have all these economic things happening, um, state owned or state funded, and also pushing this narrative at the same time. Do you see those two things going hand in hand or 
um or are these things you know these these attempts to control a variety of things um somewhat separate I mean, there's definitely been accusations of uh, what uh, many have taken to calling the debt trap diplomacy. Um, and I mean, I right. think it's it's certainly concerning that we see uh, through corrupt, uh, non-transparent, um, you know, non-public, non-open uh, bidding processes that Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises or uh, you know large enterprises that you know purport to be independent of the state, but often there's you know clear state connections often get these, uh, you know, large um, development contracts and so forth, uh, which raises clearer problems around transparency and, and so forth. Um, and often we see this taking place in various countries without robust uh, rule of law, without robust transparency and anti-corruption, um, you know, measures in place. And certainly this is a concern. Um, if anything, I think though what, you know, what we see, this is also part of, is because where other uh, countries will uh, engage in financial support for development projects and so forth. It's usually um, largely based on the, the funding side, less bringing also uh, workers. And China often in these negotiations brings a high number of, of Chinese laborers with them. And this is to deal with the fact that you have a massive labor surplus in China. And it's a country that's looking always for ways of uh, stimulating, artificially stimulating uh, demand for that labor. One of, if not first and foremost, priorities of the Communist Party under Xi Jinping has been to, or even predating Xi Jinping, but I mean, the party is very focused on maintaining social stability, um, maintaining uh, calm, preventing any kind of disturbances, uh, collective organizing around labor or other human rights issues. And so, of course, one way to maintain that calm artificially is the same in how we see a lot of the artificial boom, uh, building boom in inside of China. Entire cities are built up and left vacant for years. And a lot of the foreign development projects that China is engaged in is part of a similar calculus of also stimulating, uh, you know, artificial demand for for its labor surplus. OK, fair enough. Um one more quick question about safeguard defenders before we move on to article 19 what's on the horizon for safeguard defenders and and i guess maybe even just in the short term um beyond uh getting cgtn's uh, licenses uh, broadcast licenses revoked what are you hoping to achieve well safeguard defenders i think is really one of the the leading organizations working on human rights in china on a, a, a few different issues, um, forced confessions and the uh, manipulation of uh, media environments is one of them, certainly. Uh, also forms of uh, arbitrary and secret detention. Uh, under China, the criminal procedure law uh, has a, a particular custodial mechanism which is called residential surveillance at a designated location. Um, it's a mouthful to basically describe a six month period of enforced disappearance. The police are allowed to take someone under the criminal procedure law, hold them at a secret location with no contact to a lawyer, no contact to family members. Um, under the definition of an enforced disappearance in international law, their fate or whereabouts is unknown. Uh, and often in these circumstances, torture uh, is common. And case after case, people have been subjected to uh, various forms of, of mistreatment that rise to the level of torture, as well as uh, residential surveillance at a designated location or RSDL. Uh, Safeguard Defenders has also done uh, considerable work on a very similar system of arbitrary and secret detention uh, that came about in 2018 under the National Supervision Commission uh, called Liojir, which effectively is the same thing. Um, and so one of the things on the horizon, I would say, that we're focused on, and we've been making strides in terms of international advocacy and campaigning and awareness raising, and we'll continue to pursue, is around these uh, widespread uh, systematic uh, mechanisms for arbitrarily and secretly detaining individuals wherein in torture is, is often common. And, and in addition to this, where the organization is really moving forward is in exploring the um, 
concerns around extradition agreements, bilateral extradition agreements signed between China and, and other countries. Uh, quite unfortunately, we saw just two years ago, uh, Belgium uh, entered into force a bilateral extradition agreement with China, which is shocking uh, for a democracy, a country uh, governed by the rule of law that claims to support and uphold human rights, to enter into such an agreement with a country where any extradition, which means someone from Belgium sent back to China, there is no hope, no chance of expecting a fair trial, a country where torture is widespread. Um, international norms are clear that states are not to send someone back to another country where there are legitimate grounds for fear of persecution. And per persecution includes things like torture, like uh, discrimination based on race, nationality, ethnicity, religion. So if you're a Uyghur, if you're a Tibetan and you're anywhere and you're extradited back to China, the country that is sending you is violating any number of its obligations and international uh, law. And so it's very concerning that we see um, a rush by China to push out these bilateral extradition agreements with a number of countries. Um, just uh, earlier this month, uh, the New Zealand Supreme Court, for example, ruled that a Korean citizen, permanent resident of New Zealand, could be extradited to China to stand trial for a murder charge. Um, and I don't take any position on the um, you know, his guilt or his innocence. But the concern is that the New Zealand Supreme Court said he could be extradited to China if China delivers a diplomatic assurance that he won't be tortured or that he will be given a fair trial. Um, and we've seen time and time again that there is no reason, no justification to believe these diplomatic assurances from China because they break diplomatic assurances, they break consular agreements uh, frequently. And so really what Safeguard Defenders is trying to do in this larger narrative around extraditions is to raise awareness of the concern, um, to push governments that already have ratified extradition agreements to scale back, to repeal them, and to work in the process where we have ongoing cases, such as this one in New Zealand, to provide support to the legal apparatus, to the political apparatus, again, to, to make them aware of the concerns in China, uh, the concerns that these countries should have in violating their own obligations under national criminal and human rights law um, to prevent this type of extradition. Um, so I think these are these are really the areas where Safeguard Defenders is, is focused right now and and where we, we hope to move in the future. Okay, that's uh... <laughs> unfortunately just because of the the size of the uh, of, of the government of China and of course the the influence that the absolute influence that the Communist Party of China carries there uh, you know you certainly have your work cut out for you but I think they, these are really uh, worthy goals uh, obviously and um, and I wish you the best of luck with that. Turning our attention a little bit over to Article 19, uh, what is this organization and, and what, uh, what are its goals? So Article 19 is an international freedom of expression organization. Um, my work with Article 19 as the Asia Digital Program Officer uh, covers a, quite a large swath of, of geography. Um, the whole Asia Pacific effectively, um, although um, certain countries are, are more priority than others. Um, but it, within this, I mean, my work is, is focused on internet freedom, uh, digital rights issues, and, and some of the larger uh, discourses on technology and human rights, uh, which are quite unfortunately across the region from South Asia to Southeast Asia and East Asia. Uh, from India to Vietnam to China, um, really we see uh, a serious backtracking. Uh, some more advanced in that process of backtracking than others, certainly. Um, but largely across the board, we see governments enacting laws and policies that restrict the freedom of expression, access of information, that are restricting privacy, uh, that are restricting the uh, rights to freedom of assembly and association, online. Um, some has been done under the cover of uh, COVID pandemic response. Uh, some predate that uh, done under the cover of combating fake news. Um, unfortunately, what we see happening in other parts of the world really has a rippling effect here in this region. So when the United States 
when the president of the United States talks about fake news, it empowers heads of state in other parts of the world, such as in the Philippines, such as in Thailand, where m much more unchecked authoritarian governments are allowed to use the uh, narrative, the excuse of fake news to crack down on, to silence, to intimidate, to imprison uh, legitimate journalism, independent press uh, that is critical of the state simply because it's branded as, as fake news. I struggle to ask this question, um, maybe not struggle is the right word, but I, I, I want to ask this question only because of, uh, I, I guess, at least what historical context I know for um, the history of the APAC region and um, certainly uh, the impact that World War II had on a lot of places, uh, the Vietnam War, of course, as well. But given how much or how little um, progress there has been made to uh, democratize um, Asian countries and and give you know residents sit and citizens more freedom, do you have any sort of sense of why there's being the this this withdrawal or this backtracking of freedoms that were previously available? And like, and why these governments feel the need to to take advantage of this fake news situation and and, and you know pull some of that back and and make other changes under the guise of COVID? Like, what what are some of the the, the driving factors there? Do you think, or have you heard? I mean, I think in a lot of countries in this region, unfortunately, uh, they have ranked quite low on uh, freedom indexes, um, such as the mm -hmm. Freedom House Index, the Reporters Without Borders, World Press Freedom Index. Um, so civil and political rights, press freedom uh, indicators like this are, are relatively low in, in many uh, ASEAN and APEC countries, um, and they have been for, for quite some time. Uh, some countries have really never had uh, anything resembling uh, a free and independent press, or they haven't for, for decades. I mean, yes, you mentioned uh, Vietnam, but, uh, you know, Vietnam is a country that was, was you know, riven by, by war for decades. And from 1975 onward, under the current uh, political system, there has never been an independent press. There has never been, uh, you know, robust freedom of expression, whether it's you know, print media or, you know, later uh, online space. Um, some of the countries in the region have been under military, uh, direct military rule, non-democratic military rule uh, brought about by successive coups, overthrowing the democratically elected uh, political systems uh, repeatedly over the last few decades. So in some regards, even though I think that we can legitimately say that it's a backtracking on certain issues. Um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of uh, countries in the region started that backtracking from an already fairly uh, low position in terms of civil and political rights, in terms of, um, you know, some of these indicators. Malaysia, for example, has never uh, ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's never ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. And these are the, the fundamental uh, you know, building blocks of international human rights law. Some people call them the International Human Rights Bill of Rights. Um, you know, they were widely, uh, you know, ratified by, you know, countries around the world in the 1960s and 70s. And still to this day, Malaysia never has. Cambodia, on the other hand, has ratified these treaties. In fact, Cambodia has ratified um, a great number of international human rights treaties, but this was part of the Paris Peace Accords. This was part of the process um, through uh, the late 80s and early 90s, essentially, of the UN-led mission, uh, you know, post-conflict, post-Khmer Rouge, uh, reconstruction of Cambodia. So it joined into these conventions. Um, and unfortunately, we have really seen over the last nearly decade, under Hun Sen's now 30-plus year rule, um, that these commitments made to uh, uphold certain international human rights obligations are meaningless. Um, and continually, uh, the government in Cambodia, as, as well as others, uh, backtracks in the sense that whereas perhaps in Cambodia, there was an independent media, the uh, Cambodia Daily, the Phnom Penh Post, um, and yet through a series of manipulations of 
tax laws or forcing out independent ownership, um, the independence of these publications was, was stripped away, as was the uh, you know, CNRP, um, the op opposition party, was arbitrarily uh, disbanded. Um, and this is not to say this is only happening in Cambodia, um, but certainly this is kind of where the region is at. Um, it's in many countries, unfortunately, started pretty low. Um, and what we have seen is this backtracking, obviously predating COVID, predating, uh, you know, narratives around fake news. Um, I think that, it, you know, in, in geopolitics, things are incredibly complicated and we can't um, uh, distill them down to only a few individual factors, but large factors within the uh, process that we're seeing unfold certainly are a, the rise of China, the ideological symbolic influence that China has as an authoritarian uh, model of political and economic governance uh, through direct economic or military support, but just in general, the sort of ideological creep, um, as well as we've seen, because we've seen this in other parts of the world as well, the rising nationalism. I think really, unfortunately, the, the US uh, government uh, has made um, has made a lot of this also possible um, by also joining the bandwagon of rising nationalism, especially in the last uh, you know, four, four or five years. Um, and so it's really unfortunate when you see uh, a powerful alternative that's pro-authoritarian rising and supporting the backtracking of rights, and at the same time, the withdrawal of overtly, you know, outwardly, at least you know, in, in rhetoric, um, you know, pro-human rights, pro-democracy, uh, you know, actors from the EU to the US and others not holding these same perpetrators accountable. Um, but obviously there's many other factors of why we see this backsliding happening. Yeah, and then, and you don't need to comment on this, but um, just last week the G7 met and word is that uh, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was calling on the rest of the G7 to really put together a plan on how to come back at China, if you, if we can use those terms, and and I guess start to push back on a lot of these things you and I are talking about today. And um, from the reporting I read, a lot of hesitation from Angela Merkel, from Emmanuel Macron, to to do anything too drastic or or you know too extreme in their eyes. Um, and you know basically just have a lot more meetings and <laughs> and you know do things in the uh, extreme diplomatic manner uh, that I think Europe has probably become known for, which I worry ultimately will lead to nothing. Uh, and while I was certainly rather surprised that uh, that it would be Justin Trudeau, you know, uh, uh, really standing up and potentially going after this particular topic, I was kind of happy to see it. Like I'm, I'm, it, it, I don't think it's really any secret. I'm a bit of a China hawk, and and so I was kind of almost excited uh I, I would dare say that somebody was willing to to you know at that stage was willing to stand up and say like we I, we actually need to do something here uh and of course you know a lot of hesitation around the rest of the table from yeah. from what i read to uh to do anything concrete in the short term i guess um you you mentioned uh, a, a series of coups and, uh, you know, uh, happening all over the place. Uh, Myanmar, Myanmar, or depending on your preference, Burma. Uh, earlier this year, you wrote about the Myanmar coup and how to bypass digital dictatorship. Can you tell us a little bit more about what happened and what you were advising there? Sure. I just quickly respond, actually, to your, to your last point, though. Um, I, sure. I mean, I think, you know, the reason why we, we see this coming from Canada is that um, since December of 2018, two Canadian citizens, one uh, sometimes reported as a former diplomat, but, but technically still uh, a diplomat, um, two Canadian citizens, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, since December of 2018 have been kept arbitrarily imprisoned, pretrial detention in China, at times months without any consular access. Last year, they went from January to October without any access to consular representatives. Um, I mean, this is not only a, a, a flagrant violation of the China-Canada consular you know, relations agreement um, and a number of other sort of diplomatic protocols, 
uh, clearly within this uh, period of denial of consular access, the two Michaels have uh, reported uh, treatment that rises to the level of torture from sleep deprivation, uh, prolonged solitary confinement and other things. Their detentions, and they're in no means the isolated cases of foreign citizens who have been detained, um, prolonged detention arbitrarily in China, are cases of hostage diplomacy. Uh, China lashed out at these two Canadian citizens because Canada is holding for a request from the U.S. the daughter of the founder of Ch one of China's largest uh, tech companies, Huawei. Um, and we can go into the merits Mangan of Joe. exactly. And we can go into the merits of why she's being held and what's happening with her. But she's in house arrest in a relatively by all accounts, comfortable living situation in Vancouver, British Columbia, nice place. She's able to order pizza. Penthouse apartment. And they're yeah. being tortured. Um, and they're, they're not the only ones. There's, there's others, of course, as well within this process. A former Canadian uh, ambassador to China has uh, you know, really lashed out at the world uh, community for believing that we can continue to engage with China business as usual. And it's time to step in you know to a new strategy of engagement um and i think that it's it's really concerning that we haven't seen more pushback against china for this type of uh abuse of foreign nationals especially i mean but then again it stands to reason china hasn't been really held accountable for widespread human rights abuses against its own citizens so it steps up uh the repressive tactics and now begins to increasingly treat citizens of any country the same with the same disregard for their fundamental human rights as it has been its own citizens. Um, anyway, I, that, that's all I'll say on that. But I think, yeah, what we see happening from Canada really should be, uh, you know, leading the way in many regards of taking an, a new uh, stance and a new position on China. But fundamentally, that, uh, that pressure, that um, approach where I support completely holding uh, perpetrators accountable, I think it also needs to be strategic and it needs to be grounded in international human rights and it needs to be grounded also in the rule of law. It can't just be uh, you know, a, a militaristic response. It can't just be a knee-jerk reaction. There also needs to be a strategy behind it. Um, and that's where I think sure. just uh, you know, a blanket uh, ban or targeting any Chinese student coming into the United States or these other sort of knee-jerk reactions are ultimately uh, grounded in xenophobia, they're grounded in racism, and on any approach to holding any state actor accountable for their behavior obviously also can't succumb to this type of xenophobic or racist hysteria. Um, you know, what happened in the 1980s in the United States when Japan was a rising, you know, tech and automobile producer, the amount of violence against Japanese, uh, you know, uh, immigrants, Japanese citizens, uh, Japanese American citizens in the U.S., it was astronomical. And I mean, it was, it was uh, inexcusable. And now we've seen, unfortunately, some similar rhetoric um, against, uh, you know, Chinese uh, students in U.S. universities and so forth. So absolutely, yeah. we need a harsh reaction to hold China accountable, but I think we also have to be very careful in how we approach that. Um, sure. Myanmar, digital uh, dictatorship, yes. <laughs> um, how's that for a transition? Um, <laughs> That's a perfect segue. You know, on, it's, um, it's, it's an absolute tragedy what has, what has happened in, in Myanmar. Um, I have, I've really only been sort of tangentially working on, on human rights issues in Myanmar uh, for the last six years or so. Um, I traveled to Myanmar the first time in 2013 after a degree of opening. Um, but friends and colleagues, and certainly um, counting those among the, the Burmese civil society human rights movement who have devoted their lives or the last 10, 15 years of their work to political uh, opening to uh, developing human rights, uh, democratic institutions. Um, I mean, it's really a tragic uh, regression that the Burmese military, uh, which is called the Tatmadaw, um, has just completely uh, thrown the last decade plus uh, period of time. All of that work, all of that 
blood, sweat, and tears. Um, and now we have literal blood on the streets, washing the streets of the country um, as police and military effectively death squads. People are being gunned down in the streets. Um, those who are detained, protest leaders, artists, hospital workers, bank workers, anyone who joins the, uh, you know, any protest, any demonstration who speaks out um, against the regime are at risk of being uh, snagged up, thrown into prison, and uh, torture in prison is skyrocketing. The situation in the country is, is absolutely tragic. Um, it's been condemned by, uh, you know, world bodies. But again, we talk about accountability. We talk about more concrete measures. Um, you know, the time for another minister of foreign affairs or, you know, speaker of parliament or whichever high level official condemns the uh, actions of the Tatmada, no more condemnation. We need action. Um, there needs to be serious repercussions for what the, the Burmese military has done. Absolutely. Um, when I wrote that piece on digital dictatorship, this was in the early days of the coup. Um, this was still in early February. Uh, I think, um, you know, we all in the human rights movement tend to be more pessimistic than your average person just because what we often are up against. But, um, you know, there wasn't necessarily the assumption that things were going to suddenly get better, but it was still early um, in the process. We didn't know how bad they were going to get uh, now. But writing that piece was about the way that the, the Burmese military has um, terrorized the population through digital means. And some of those means, uh, although a lot of these have actually been scaled back uh, now in June, but for 72 nights, for example, for 72 consecutive nights, every single night uh, for about eight hours, the internet was shut down completely. Um, a blackout, internet blackout across the country. Um, this is when house raids were taking place. People were being shot. People were being taken from their homes. There was no ability to communicate, not only with you know your loved ones, maybe outside of the country or colleagues or journalists, but you couldn't contact family if you were living in Yangon and you had family in Ketchin State or something like this. Um, this was done to silence and to terrorize. Uh, mobile internet was shut down. Uh, public Wi-Fi was shut down. I mean, these were all efforts that were done to block uh, individuals who are out in public, out in the streets, from filming and uploading evidence of atrocities by the police and the military. Right. Um, it's part of a trend of internet shutdowns during political events um, that we see uh, really on the rise. The uh, Keep It On Coalition uh, which is really led by uh, a human rights organization, uh, a digital rights organization called Access Now. Um, Article 19, my organization is a member of the Keep It On Coalition. Many other organizations are part of the uh, coalition. And the work of the coalition is to not only raise awareness that internet shutdowns are about more than just, okay, you can't get onto Facebook today, no big deal, we'll do it tomorrow. But real human rights abuses can take place and documenting and disseminating those around the world uh, is made all the more challenging during an internet shutdown. Um, the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as the uh, independent experts, uh, the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and others have constantly over the last few years in various uh, communications, uh, resolutions, uh, been quite explicit. Um, that not only the same rights that we have offline should apply online, but also that the targeted uh, denial, the cut down, the interruption of, of internet connection, internet service like this uh, can and often does itself rise to a human rights, a gross human rights abuse for the reasons of what can take place during them. And you look at Kashmir, for example. Um, I mean, India has really been the leader in terms of the total number of shutdowns, internet shutdowns that it's perpetrated largely in the Indian controlled part of Kashmir. Uh, Indonesia also has weaponized internet shutdowns, um, especially in the East uh, around uh, discussion of uh, human rights abuses in West Papua or uh, demonstrations for um, self-determination or, or other uh, you know, declarations of, of, of rights of West Papuans. Um, 
So, I mean, it's not only Myanmar by any means that has really weaponized internet shutdowns as part of the, the you know, new toolkit, let's say, of what defines a digital dictator. Yeah, um, this has been happening quite a bit in Nigeria recently as well, around the um, uh, NSARS uh, campaign. And, um, you know, there's been demonstrations and uh, like in the streets and all that. And a uh, similar thing happens. The government decides to shut down the Internet for a while yeah. or at least at the very least restrict access to certain websites where this sort of thing will be shared uh, or is most likely to be shared. Twitter, Facebook, um, you know, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, and it's really sad that, um, you know, as opposed to, to giving people more freedoms and dealing with criminals as, as needed, uh, uh, you know, they, they feel the need to simply shut down any conversation whatsoever and, uh, and deal with things in a much, much more harsh manner. Um, and I, I these, this day and age, I, I struggle to reconcile the the goals and the methods uh compared with how far we've come relatively speaking uh even from the recent past at least in certain parts of the world obviously not not everywhere it, it's progress is not uh is not universal and is certainly not uh, uh happened to the same level uh, everywhere Oh, I'm not sure if I was prepared for this at seven o'clock in the morning, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, but you, it. you, well, you, but you deal with this every day. So I'm, I'm certainly not going to sit here and complain. Um, let's turn this around a little bit. How do you think having secure and open internet access has helped businesses and people throughout the pandemic where, where it was available at least? I mean, I think without access to an independent uh, source of information, uh, people are going to be at a disadvantage, um, public health emergency or not. Um, having access to independent information is, I mean, in, I mean, it is a uh, human right under the International Covenant of uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, and it should be something that's. Um, promoted and, and defended at all times, um, but especially in a, in a period such as this last, God, year and a half now, um, it just, we're never, <laughs> we'll never escape this, will we? It's already been, you know, over a year and a half, I guess. Feels, um, feels like that sometimes. I see, yeah, the, 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 the last, you know, the last 10 years since 2020, right? Um, you know, of course, of course, in the, this last time period, it's, 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 it's especially important. Um, how else are people going to access information about, um, you know, um, determining fact from from disinformation, right? Um, and some of that disinformation uh, is also spread easily on online. But the antidote to that disinformation also uh, is more um, widely available when internet access, independent internet access, is also widely available. Um, unfortunately, there's been a lot of conspiracies from you know, racist questioning about whether you can get the COVID uh, virus from eating Chinese food, absurdities like this, um, to uh, blaming migrant worker, Burmese migrant workers in Thailand or something like this as a, as a vector. Um, so there's a lot of uh, racist disinformation, uh, disinformation or misinformation around uh, cures to COVID from the absurdity of Donald Trump's uh, drinking Clorox bleach to the relatively equal absurdity to um, figureheads in some countries in this part of the region just saying heat and a good diet or spices um, will cure the uh, pandemic situation. So obviously having uh, open access to the internet is important to dispel uh, as much as it is uh, dangerous for its dissemination. Um, but again, I mean, yeah. I think always un under any circumstance, we, we need to recognize the importance and fight for the you know open accessibility of of an independent uh, internet okay uh let's end off on this final question which I, I like to ask everybody whenever possible how do you protect your privacy online um i think that a lot of people can get uh overly caught up in this idea that you can um achieve full uh privacy protection in everything that you do and often that's just not the case um, I think any anyone who at any time 
uh, starts to think about improving their digital security and, and you know protecting their privacy online and, and you know various other elements of, of digital security needs to begin with a threat assessment. Um, I mean, really, what what is it that you're trying to accomplish by uh, you know making these changes to your digital hygiene? Um, you know, what is the purpose? What are the risks that you're facing? Um, you know, if if someone asks me how do you keep yourself more secure online? Uh, the, my first, you know, question is, you know, or, you know, thinking about who, who that person is. Is it my, you know, my mother, uh, you know, who's, you know, 70 year old retired art teacher living in, you know, a suburb in outside of, you know, in, a, in, in the United States? Um, or is it a, you know, 23 year old LGBT activist from Myanmar? Um, you know, is it a land rights defender in Cambodia? So, you know, the beginning of that question is, is always to then say it has to be uh, tailored to you, to your needs, to your comfort level. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing within that uh, concept of, um, you know, tailoring it to your needs um, is to recognize that um, there's a lot of tools that, that exist. And sometimes, um, you know, those, those tools are also developed for other people that uh, have no real, you know, value or, or transferability to what you're doing. And I mean, this is not really your question. I'm going off in a tangent here now, but I think That's okay. a lot of the, um, the applications, the tools that exist um, are still largely uh, designed and developed by uh, people who are thinking about universal application from uh, you know, an office in Berlin or Palo Alto or Seattle or something like this. Um, and as much as any conversation around developing digital security uh, strategies and tactics for an individual needs to begin with, you know, their threat assessment, the tools themselves, the applications that exist, I think that, you know, the, the global, uh, you know, digital security community is starting to do a much better job of this, of course, but consistently the, the demand from, uh, you know, people in this region, people from, uh, you know, other than those countries or those cities that I mentioned, they need to be part of the design process. Um, you know, developing uh, tools and tactics needs to be a multi-stakeholder process that involves uh, those individuals who are most at risk. Um, and, you know, their needs, their use cases need to be taken into consideration rather than developing an application and then translating it into a local language and saying, done, we have you know, produced a new security application that's great for you to use. Um, but we have to right. begin, begin from, uh, you know, human rights based design, um, which includes, you know, equal participation voice of the same marginalized, the same at risk communities that supposedly, um, you know, these apps and these tools are being designed for. Um, but I, I think, you know, um, without answering your question specifically about what I uh, individually do, um, I would say, or, you know, leave it, um, you know, on a note of recommendation, there's some really excellent organizations out there that have produced a number of great toolkits and great guides for where to go for answering these questions. Is this tool right for me? Is this how I assess my uh, threat situation? Do I need to have, you know, this level or this level of digital security? The Electronic Frontiers Foundation does an excellent job at that. At Witness Org does an excellent job at that. Uh, the Tactical Tech Collective um, also does an excellent job at that. Access Now has a digital helpline. Um, Frontline Defenders, uh, there's some great organizations that have you know, widely available, you know, publicly available uh, resources and dedicated people um, out there to help answer these questions. They do trainings for human rights defenders and communities around the world. Um, and if anything, I think what we should be encouraging those who control the purse strings um, is really to invest more in the type of work that these organizations are doing um, and to make sure that any investment into you know, next generation security and privacy tools um, are really done independently, open source, and with the, the needs and interests of especially frontline and marginalized communities, uh, you know, part of the process from from day one and not after it's been developed and released. Yeah, fair point. Uh, I think we, we heard a very similar message from uh, Dragana Kaurin from the, the localization lab um, just a few weeks ago. So yeah, the thanks work, for that. The work they do is great. 
Terrific. Michael, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, really appreciate you uh, staying up. Well, maybe not, not staying up too not late, so but uh, hanging back <laughs> into your evening uh, and spending some time with us uh, uh, here on Private Podcast. And hope everybody enjoyed listening, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Derek.